We have a thought for the day. This is called Living More Voluntarily, and it comes from Voluntary Simplicity, once again, by Dwayne Elgin. And we are reading from page 123. To live voluntarily requires not only that we be conscious of the choices before us, that's the outer world, but also that we be conscious of ourselves as we select among those choices coming from the inner world. We must be conscious of both choices and chooser if we are to act voluntarily. Put differently, to act voluntarily is to act in a self-determining manner. But who is the self making the decisions? If that self is both socially and psychologically conditioned into habitual patterns of thought and action, then behavior can hardly be considered voluntary. Therefore, self-realization, the process of realizing who the self really is, is crucial to self-determination and voluntary action. The point is that the more precise and sustained is our conscious knowing of ourselves, the more voluntary or choiceful our participation in life can be. If we are inattentive in noticing ourselves going through life, then the choicefulness with which we live will be commensurately diminished. The more conscious we are of our passage through life, the more skillfully we can act, and the more harmonious can be the relationship between our inner experience and our outer experience. To fully appreciate what it means to act voluntarily, we must acknowledge to ourselves the extent to which we tend to act involuntarily. We tend to run on automatic, act in habitual and pre-programmed ways to a much greater extent than we commonly recognize. Consider, for example, how we learned to walk as children. At first, walking was an enormous struggle. It required all our energy and attention. Within a few months, the period of intense struggle passed. As the ability to walk became increasingly automated, we began to focus our attention on other things, reaching, touching, climbing. In the same manner, we have learned and largely automated virtually every facet of our daily lives, walking, driving, reading, working, relating to others, and so on. This habitual patterning of behavior extends into the most intimate details of our lives. The knot we make in tying our shoes, the manner in which we brush our teeth, which leg we put first into a pair of pants, and so on. Not only do automatic patterns of behavior pervade nearly every aspect of our physical existence, they also condition how we think and feel. To be sure, there is a degree of variety in our thinking, feeling, and behaving, yet the variety tends to be predictable since it's derived largely from pre-programmed and habituated patterns of response to the world. If we do not become conscious of these automated patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving, then we become, by default, human automatons. We tend not to notice or appreciate the degree to which we run on automatic largely because we live in an almost constant state of mental distraction. Our minds are constantly moving about at a lightning-fast pace, thinking about the future, replaying conversations from the past, engaging in inner role-playing, and so on. Without sustained attention, it's difficult to appreciate the extent to which we live ensnared in an automated, reflexive, 
dreamlike reality that is a subtle and continuously changing blend of fantasy, inner dialogue, memory, planning, and so on. The fact that we spend years acquiring vast amounts of mental content does not mean that we are thereby either substantially aware of or in control of our mental processes. This fact is clearly described by Roger Walsh, a physician, psychiatrist, and brain researcher. His vivid description of the nature of thought processes as revealed in the early stages of meditative practice is so useful to our discussion that I quote his comments at length. Quote, I was forced to recognize, this is Roger talking about his attempt to meditate. I was forced to recognize that what I had formerly believed to be my rational mind, preoccupied with cognition, planning, problem solving, etc., actually comprised a frantic torrent of forceful, demanding, loud, and often unrelated thoughts and fantasies, which filled an unbelievable proportion of consciousness even during purposeful behavior. The incredible proportion of consciousness which this fantasy world occupied, am I powerless to remove it for more than a few seconds? And my former state of mindlessness or ignorance of its existence staggered me. Foremost among the implicit beliefs of Orthodox Western psychology is the assumption that man spends most of his time reasoning and problem-solving, and that only neurotics and other abnormals spend much time outside of leisure in fantasy. However, it is my impression that prolonged self-observation will show that at most times we are living almost in a dream world in which we skillfully and automatically, yet unknowingly, blend inputs from reality and fantasy in accordance with our needs and defenses. Let me say that again. Prolonged self-observation will show that most times we are living almost in a dream world in which we skillfully and automatically yet unknowingly blend inputs from reality and fantasy in accordance with our needs and defenses. The subtlety, complexity, infinite range and number and entrapping power of the fantasies which the mind creates seem almost impossible to comprehend, to differentiate from reality while within them, and even more so to describe to one who has not experienced them. End quote. So as you go through your day, become aware of how much time you're really looking at, listening to, thinking about what's really going on right in front of you. How much of your time are you spending lost in this imaginary world of illusions, thoughts, fantasies, expectations, assumptions about the past, the present, and the future? And while you're at it, make a great day.